So unfortunately, I use Reddit. But I'm more of a lurker than a poster. When I'm not looking at cute pictures of critters on capybaras, I occasionally visit r slash manga because I read a lot and I'm always looking for new stories to check out. Every week, a user named Data Weibo posts a list of the most popular manga, and they're ranked by the amount of upvotes that each chapter gets during that seven day time frame. On this list, you might have a chance of seeing anything from a heartfelt story about people healing from past traumas to classy top tier epics like Turns Out My Dick Was a Cute Girl. I decided to read the first 10 chapters of the top 10, and I have to admit that there are some bangers on this list. Originally, this wasn't supposed to be a recommendation video, but it kind of turned into one. So feel free to skip around and see if something grabs your attention. A few more things before we start though. Let me know what your favorite thing you're reading or watching is in the comments. I need recommendations for myself and who knows, maybe I'll end up making a video about one of them in the future. Also, it would be dope if you hit the sub button because like 95% of you aren't subbed and that is a crazy ratio to have. Okay, thanks. Now let's get into it. Taro Sakamoto is a legendary assassin. Villains fear him and other hitmen want to be him. He's basically Japanese John Wick. He meets a woman and decides to retire, vowing to leave his days of killing behind him. He starts living a quiet life, falls in love, has a kid, gets fat, and opens his own business. But once you've become an assassin, any peace that you may have never lasts forever. I'm thinking I'm back. Someone places a bounty on Sakamoto's head, and he wants to know who and why. On the surface, Sakamoto Days seems like a very goofy manga that you wouldn't expect much from. Just an average action comedy that you most likely skip by without thinking too hard about it. But once you start reading it, damn, it's a fun read. At first, the humor lies in the fact that even though Sakamoto looks like he's really out of shape, he still has the exact same skills and impulses that he had when he was at his peak. The things he is capable of are insane, and it doesn't stop at just him. The more characters that get introduced, the more specialties and weapons we get to see them use. And I'm so serious when I say that it just casually makes for some of the best action in a shonen out right now. This is what you'll stay for, but you're also rewarded with some easy to love and hate characters in the cast. Over time, more enemies surface, and Sakamoto also gains more allies, expanding his family. One day, his old partner Shin shows up trying to assassinate him. And in the past, this would have been a suicide mission, but Sakamoto is a changed man. He doesn't kill anymore because he has a wife who taught him the value of a human life, and a daughter that he wants to set an example for. So you want to know how he handles it? He beats Shin's ass and goes, here's an apron, you're not an assassin anymore, bud. Starts weeping. The story isn't anything spectacular, but it's good enough to make you want to know more about this world of assassins and Sakamoto's past that's gradually coming back to haunt him. And we get exactly that. We get to see how this family man with a strong sense of justice used to operate when he was an indifferent killing machine. It's so sick, and out of all of the weekly shonen jump manga that I read, Sakamoto Days is one of the most consistently good ones. Chain Soldier is a manga that puts the sub in subreddit. I knew that the manga subreddit was a safe haven for the super horny down bad community because half the posts are just people trying to find the source for a hentai. But this has been consistently making the list at least since last December. The story takes place in a world where portals to another dimension called Maho start popping up all over the place. With these portals come monsters called Shuki and mysterious fruits named peaches that give superpowers or blessings exclusively to women. The power balance is immediately destroyed. Society quickly shifts toward a matriarchy and men get their asses in the kitchen where they belong. The main character, Yuki, is about to graduate from high school and is concerned about what he'll do for a career when his only skills are keeping a house and cooking. On the way home from school one day, he's thrust through a portal and gets attacked by monsters until a member of the anti-demon corps comes to save him. This is Kyoka. She joins the ADC after her hometown is destroyed by the Shuki. Kyoka has eaten one of the peaches we talked about earlier and it gives her the blessing of slave. Hear me out. She can turn the Shuki into her slaves and she uses them to fight the others, but this isn't enough and the pair are quickly overwhelmed. The only way for them to make it out alive is if Yuki agrees to become her slave, and he does it. He's immediately transformed and gains superpowers, as well as the chance to have a purpose being a hero in the anti-demon core, and also be the butler since men aren't really allowed. Chain Soldier is written by the guy that made Akame Got Kill, a guilty pleasure of mine known for being way too edgy. But this is edgy in a whole other way. Instead of excessive violence and gore, there's just a lot of nudity. I mean, who needs plot when you have fan service, right? I don't care about oxygen. I need boobies, nothing more. The crazy thing is, with this, you actually do get more. 
The action is surprisingly well choreographed, and there's a good diversity among the powers the characters have. Yuki gets other forms depending on who uses him, and the anti-demon core members can do anything from changing their size like Ant-Man to manipulating time. And it's cool to look at because the art is nice as well. I don't know what the science is, but it's like whenever manga artists are told they're going to be drawing nudity, they draw A-tier art at minimum. Each time a character uses Yuki's powers, they have to give him a reward that's equivalent to the amount of effort he puts in. The rewards come from his latent desires, and my guy only has one thing on his mind. And normally, when a series that's heavy on fanservice like this comes along, you expect the characters to be extremely generic placeholders. But this cast feels unique from one another. They have legitimate motivations. There's family drama, sibling rivalries, and thirsts for revenge. And yeah, sure, revenge tales can be basic too, but at least they're cool. What surprised me the most about Chain Soldier is that there's an actual plot. Let's be honest though, you aren't going to be reading for the plot, but you could if you wanted to. I'm Dating a Dark Summoner takes place in your average fantasy world. It's got elves, monsters, the whole nine. The main cast consists of a party of demon hunters, and the newest member is Amona, a dark summoner demi-human who uses demonic powers. She and the team's cleric, a priest named Roni, get off on the wrong foot because he's kinda racist, and nobody expects them to get along. But on their first day working together, they have a one-night stand. They go on to become friends with benefits while trying to hide it, but everyone in the town knows because they aren't exactly good at being low-key about these things. This is obviously another not safe for work manga, but unlike Chain Soldier, there's no real story to it. It is less graphic, kind of, but it still is mostly fan service with very little substance other than that. I kind of wanted to dislike it based on the first chapter alone, but it's actually hilarious. When I say something's funny, most of the time I don't actually laugh. At most, I'll think to myself, ha <laughs> while keeping a very straight face. This made me crack up laughing, but mostly because of this cute little imp that Amona summons. He's an Olympic level instigator and a dramatic attention hog that teases the main cast. He definitely carries the manga, and I probably would have dropped this way before chapter 10 if it wasn't for him, but I ended up sticking around to see that there are other funny things that happen. The humor is very raunchy all the way around. I'm a fan of that type of thing, but I still don't think I'll keep reading it for now. Oyama is living in the fantasy of most teenage boys. He has his own apartment, and one day randomly, a girl that he barely knows from his class named Akatsu shows up and starts hanging out there. At first, he's kind of annoyed because, you know, she wasn't invited, but he is also clueless and introverted. He just wants to be left alone with his manga, video games, and other teenage boy activities, but she won't leave. The main character is the super nervous type that just goes with the flow. He doesn't even really say much in the first few chapters. Now that I think of it, most of his lines are just his inner thoughts. He kind of just sits there as she teases him in some way and then she gets embarrassed when it goes too far. Over time, the two grow closer and develop feelings for each other, but they're both too dumb to notice. It's a very generic story, but I can see the appeal. From what I've read, I get the impression that this is a bit of a slow burn, which I'd imagine isn't too bad because the story doesn't take that long to get through. Each chapter is only four pages, and it mostly takes place in Uyama's room. There also aren't too many characters that you have to remember. I ended up reading a few extra chapters because they were so short, and other than their relationships slowly evolving over time, I don't really see much interesting about this one, even as a romance. Literally the next manga in this list is a way better one. If you haven't been able to tell by now, Reddit has a big soft spot for romance. There are 20 manga on this weekly list, and half of them are usually romances. I'm not a hater by any means. Romance just isn't a genre that I gravitate to first without being recommended something specific. The Dangers in My Heart has a weird start to it. Ichikawa is an unpopular outcast of a teen. He has fantasies about killing his classmates when they get on his nerves, but his main target is Yamada, a fashion model who's the most popular girl in the class. One day, he sees her by herself in the library and leaps at his chance to be really helpful. Ichikawa's actually a good guy. He tries to convince himself that he's this crazed psycho murderer when he's actually just introverted and socially awkward. This is the kid you're nice to just in case. You know, he wouldn't really do anything crazy, but if you were suspecting anybody would snap, he's the one you'd look out for. But in reality, his only problem is that he just doesn't know how to talk to people that well, even when he tries to stick up for them or help them out in some way. I was kind of annoyed at the first few pages of this actually. His inner thoughts paint him as a woman-hating creep who thinks he's a future murderer. But this aspect of his character is dropped like three chapters into the story, and it's for the best. Because even though it's supposed to be funny, it's really just not. 
I continued reading the first 10 chapters, but I didn't really vibe with them all that much. There were some laughs here and there, but nothing really stuck out to me. I didn't really care about what was happening. After I finished, I went back to read it a second time because I didn't even know what I would say about it and I ended up finding out that there is an anime, so I watched that instead. And I ended up having a much better experience with it this way. The story is focused around the interactions between Ishikawa and Yamada. They start off small like him letting her borrow his knife for a project. Then she shares her snacks with him and eventually they're having a moment. They gradually build a friendship and it becomes more and more obvious that the two of them are kind of feeling each other. It's a cute story and the anime does it so much more justice than the manga does in the beginning. That's just my opinion though. I went from not caring about the manga at all to binging the first season just because I wanted to see what happened. If romance is your jam, you might like this. Mama Yu Yu takes place in a world where demons and humans coexist because of the sacrifice of a hero. His successor is a guy named Corleo who is adopted by the demon lord Mamama. Instead of them being at war with each other, they're a family that are trying to figure out their place in a world where their titles are meaningless. Corleo is 18, and if you've ever been 18, you know this is one of those ages when you're kind of having an identity crisis. You barely know who you are or what you actually want to do with your life. This hits twice as hard for Corleo because he has his identity as the hero and everyone knows this, but what does being a hero mean when there's no one to save? He wants to go through military training. Mamama wants him to go to college, but everything changes for them when a hero from another world shows up in theirs being chased by his demon lord. Apparently, two heroes can't coexist in the same world without it causing problems, so they team up to defeat the demon, and then some other stuff happens that I don't really want to spoil, because there are only two chapters out and it's free to read both of them on Manga Plus right now. It seems like the story is going to be one of self-discovery and identity. Rather than seeing Corleo have the title of hero thrust on him unwillingly, we see him start out being the hero and desperately wanting to live up to his predecessors, but learning that ultimately what's important is him being his own type of hero in his time. There's a chance that we could see some really well-written character development here, if it doesn't get cancelled. Most shonen jump manga barely make it to 20 chapters before they get the axe, and I can't tell you how many times I've said, I have a good feeling about this one, after only a few chapters just for it to get cancelled anyway. So I'm not going to jinx it, but I do like what I've read so far and will most likely be keeping up with it. Jujutsu Kaisen is a manga that I don't really have to tell you about. It's one of the most popular series out right now and for good reason. I watched the anime and was hooked by the end of season 1, so I ran straight to the manga. I caught up in like 3 days, but I didn't expect it to be as good as it actually is. It takes place in an unforgiving world that thrusts regular people into life or death situations for the sake of protecting others who are threatened by a world they can't see. It's dark, gritty, and sad at times, but there's also this air of mystery and a looming feeling of hopelessness that have you desperately wanting to keep reading it until you see our heroes achieve some sort of victory. The best arc of the manga is actually airing right now in the anime, so the reason I've been telling people to read it is kind of going away. At this point, I'd say don't even touch the manga until you finish season 2, because the animation for it so far has been movie quality. I've still been enjoying the manga. The cast and action where season 2 will leave off are amazing, but I don't think anything that has happened since then has been as good. Don't get me wrong, it's definitely not bad, but the Shibuya incident might be the peak. After this season, if you already watched the show, there's a good chance that you're going to start reading the manga or at least be curious about it because you're going to want answers. For everything. As someone who reads the manga every week, I can admit that it does have its issues though. There is a lot of exposition for the powers and events that are happening. It's kind of like Hunter x Hunter in the regard that a lot of things need to be explained to the reader, but even with the explanations that JJK gives you, sometimes you'll be so confused that you just think, fuck it, and you'll move on so you can see the action. If you don't watch the show, then do that. Then watch the movie, then watch season 2, then start reading the manga. It could be overhyped, but I think it's worth it. One Punch Man is another one that you probably already know about. It was one of the best anime of 2015 because of how visually stunning it is. Saitama is a hero who doesn't get the recognition he deserves. He doesn't have the charisma of a traditional hero, and the fact that he can beat anyone in One Punch makes his achievements seem unbelievable. He's so strong that he's bored and doesn't get the fulfillment from fighting that he trains so hard to feel. It's a refreshing concept, but one that kind of gets old quick, so in order to balance this out, the entire supporting cast is lifted up to have the character growth that Saitama would get if he wasn't already at his peak. 
He has an apprentice named Genos that's insanely strong, but the fact that he knows how strong Saitama truly is makes him even more aware of his weaknesses. He puts everything on the line anytime he fights, and more often than not, he ends up in pretty bad shape, but he never gives up. He keeps training and getting better so that he can be recognized by the one person whose opinion he truly values, and so that he can be the best version of himself. It's kind of hard for me to think of a secondary character who doesn't have at least as much depth as he does. Right now, Saitama is strong enough to sneeze away Jupiter. He's unbeatable, but everyone else has to train and go beyond their limits in order to overcome some of the more serious threats. It's hype seeing him level a mountain with one punch, but you're drawn in by the plot and stories surrounding everyone else. And also the art. Like, look at this, it blows me away. Even if I didn't enjoy reading it, I would still check in every chapter just to admire the art. Every little detail is in there, from the drops of blood and sweat flying off the characters as they're fighting, to every piece of rubble and speck of dust that's caused by their earth-shattering attacks. One day on Twitter, the illustrator Yusuke Murata posted a picture of a cup, and the internet didn't realize that this was something he drew for practice. Yeah, you can't really tell until you pay close attention to the details in the middle and along the rim that this isn't a photo. This guy is a machine, and unironically, one of my favorite artists out right now. Oh my god, bro, is dick riding all you do? Yes, but it's not just me. The main discussion around most of the action-filled chapters of One Punch Man is, how the hell is anyone supposed to animate this? This is the type of art that looks like it would bankrupt an animation studio, and it's consistently this quality every month. Here's a random page from the manga. This is what it looked like animated in season two. I get that we were spoiled with the first season, but this is one of the rare times where I would tell someone to pretend like the show doesn't even exist after a certain point, and to only read the manga. Takakura believes in aliens, and Ayase believes in ghosts. They both think the other is stupid for it, so they come up with a dare. One would go to a haunted tunnel, the other would go to a place where aliens have been seen, and they both discover that not only are they both real, ghosts and aliens are also kind of pervy too. Once they discover these entities for the first time, Takakura and Ayase's lives are continuously disrupted by supernatural or extraterrestrial threats. I know I've spent about half of this video talking about how much I enjoy certain manga on this list, but Don the Don is the one that I really don't shut up about. It is technically a battle shonen, but that description doesn't do justice to what it really is. There is a lot of breathtaking action, but at the same time, there's a little bit of something for everyone. Romance, comedy, horror, mystery. You can honestly throw a dart at a board full of random genres, and wherever that dart lands, Don the Don has been at one point even mecha for some reason. I wouldn't be surprised if there was something like an alien bowling arc in the future. This is one of the most random manga that you will read. It continuously has me wondering, what the hell is going on here, even though the events are extremely clear in how they're described. My balls are gone? Takakura has his family jewel stolen by a ghost named Turbo Granny after she possesses him. When she adds a little bit of her powers to him to spice him up a bit, they become a rare resource full of spiritual energy that ghosts believe can bring them back to life. Obviously, he wants to get them back, but while he and Ayase are trying to get them back from Turbo Granny, she loses them, so there's no telling who or what might have them. Is this a little juvenile for a plot to be based around? Yeah, absolutely, and I actually forgot until recently that this was the goal of the main characters. But it is funny, and also the manga just isn't that shallow. Let's talk about characters. The cast is pretty big, and it expands a little bit each arc. Instead of everyone being dumped on us at one time and being shelved until they're needed in the story, we're given time to slowly learn more and more about each individual. What from their past made them the way they are now? What are their motivations? These are questions that don't go unanswered. Even with the villains, everyone has their own quirks, strengths, and weaknesses, and the way they interact with one another feels genuine. When the main cast isn't fighting against paranormal or occult threats, there are these moments between them where they might be playfully bickering, sharing a meal, or being vulnerable. You'd be surprised at how a manga that randomly has a character say the words 10 gallon wiener can also include some well-written and emotionally charged scenes that will have you going, damn, this kinda messed me up. Don Don is mostly fun, but it will make you feel things other than joy occasionally. However, it doesn't punish you for getting invested in the story. Characters don't need to be killed off every chapter just for it to be good. Aside from how dope the volume covers are, one of my favorite things about this manga are the easter eggs. They make me feel nostalgic when I read it, and they're always worked into the story in a way that's exciting but doesn't feel forced. If there is one thing that I want you to take from this video, it would be to at least give Don to Don a chance, because I promise you once this gets animated, you will be seeing people talk about it everywhere. 
Freerun is an elf and a group of heroes that goes on a 10 year journey that ends after they defeat the Demon King. But what happens after the journey is over and everyone goes their separate ways? For her, 50 years passes in an instant and she meets up with her former teammates to see that they've all aged while she remains young. After sharing one last adventure, one of her friends dies, causing her to become stricken with grief, even though she'd only known them for what seems like a brief period of time in her life. She breaks down in tears thinking, even though I knew a human's lifespan is short, why did I never think about getting to know him more? Wishing to correct this and learn more about humanity as a whole, Freerun heads off on another adventure, visiting old friends and retracing the steps they once took together years ago. This is a heartfelt, laid-back story that draws you in easily with its relatable themes, and they're clear from the start. Time is precious. Life is about forming relationships and making memories with the people you love. We often take time for granted, especially when we're younger, and this manga does a great job at portraying how we can sometimes let life and opportunities pass us by because we think, there's always tomorrow. Freerun is at least a thousand years old, and that's basically still a young adult for an elf. As you read, you can see that she's still trying to figure out the world and the things that are important in life. She goes from being an almost robotic person in the past to someone who's extremely conscious and thoughtful. She's trying her best to avoid making the same mistakes she's made in the past by showing the people around her that she cares about them, because they aren't going to be around her forever. Freerun is one of the most powerful mages, but her and her apprentice do odd, sometimes monotonous jobs in exchange for the most trivial magic spells as a reward. She has a spell that makes grapes more sour, and we find out that one of her old teammates' favorite foods was sour grapes. She has a spell that can create flowers, and she uses it to make sure that the memorial of one of her old friends is surrounded by a near-extinct type of flower from his homeland. There's something beautiful about seeing this character trying to become close to the people she's lost. If you've ever been in that position, it's kind of sobering to read. Out of everything that I read for the first time for this video, this is without a doubt the best. I got to chapter 10 and before I knew it, I was on 20. I can't really speak for the whole series because there are over 100 chapters out now, but it definitely has a great start. I just found out recently that the anime for this starts soon, so maybe be on the lookout for that if you prefer watching. Yo, thanks for watching the video. Please let me know what you think in the comments because I really enjoyed making it and I would be down to do it again or something similar if you all are interested in seeing it. Before you leave, make sure you subscribe and turn on notifications so you know when I upload. I wish I could give you a regular release schedule right now, but I can't really, so for the time being, this is the best way to keep up. I'll see you all in the next one. Peace.